Welcome, my name is Philip Swicegood with Vein Specialist of the South. My partner, Dr. Harper, cannot be here today, but the person that we are interviewing is so important and he is so timely that we just had to move forward with the interview. We are here in the home of Mark Ballard here in Macon, Georgia. Now, if you're not familiar with Mark, you must not be from around here. <laughs> so Mark, uh, you, you, you at least may know him from his social media presence, his uh, interviews on TV, his radio hits, or one of his many, many cookbooks. And so we are here today to talk about how we can have a wonderful COVID Christmas. Mark, thank you for being with us. It's my pleasure. I'm glad y'all came. Wonderful. So Mark, uh, I would envision that Christmas this year would look very different <laughs> for a lot of people out there as opposed to years in the past. And so from a, from just a like cooking perspective, what do you suggest that people keep an eye on this year as opposed to other years? Um, instead of the traditional things that people are normally making, they're opting for, I guess, comfort foods because we all need some comfort right now, quite frankly. And, um, you know, whether that's um, some kind of cheesy casserole or lasagna or something, um, you know, like that, we want something. We can't get a physical hug. We can't get, you know, any kind of touch or an island. So we can, I want it to be excused this one Christmas. We can just eat whatever. <laughs> well, um, I've never, our family's been different in the fact that even though I have all those cookbooks, we never have really had normal holiday food. But this time more than ever, my son has texted me a list of things that he wants to. Um, and most of them are things, casseroles and things that I was raised on. Yeah. I find myself even going back to um, my childhood for comfort with all this going on because we're all affected in different ways. But I actually found a um, little elf arrangement that I had asthma and was in the hospital that my mother sent me the other day that I had not seen in probably, you know, 30 or 40 years. And I mean, immediately I just swelled up and cried because I thought, you know, it takes you back to another time and everybody is kind of scared. We don't really know what's going on with all this and um, we need some comfort. Absolutely. Whether it's in food or being around, surrounding ourselves with the things we love, which is one thing we've done this year. I know people are going to think this is a lot of decorations, but those that know me know it isn't. But we have really cut back because I've gotten it, pared it down to just the things that are important to me, just the things that, you know, bring, you know, satisfaction to sit here and see, you know, things that, um, you know, mean something because they have a story or, um, or special because a certain person gave them to you. They have some sort of meaning to them. Yeah, absolutely. So, Mark, I know you are well known for your cakes, and I hear that they are not only <laughs> delicious, but just gorgeous pieces of artwork. And for and for just years now, I have I have seen these cakes around <laughs> town and even on TV from time to time. Tell us about them and tell us which cakes are your favorite right now. Well, I've been told by my son that I have to make a homemade coconut cake. Okay. So that, back when I was growing up, my birthday's next week, so I've always been a Christmas baby and all. A good recipe in one of my cookbooks is an old-timey one. It's not one that really has any kind of spirits or anything like that. It's just um, pecans and fruit and, you know, a good batter. So I definitely, you know, things like that I feel like you have to do at Christmas. You know, I'm going to make divinity and stuff like that, but... Um, I, I usually make my own birthday cake because that's so particular. <laughs> but um, Deborah gave up on that. She just said, go ahead and make it. Even despite, you know, all of these wonderful cakes that you make, and I'm sure that you try from time to time, you're actually in great shape. And so I understand that you're into biking, and that, that's one of your, like, secrets. Can you tell me a little bit about your biking? I love these. That's stuff. the only reason I bike is so I can eat. Because, you, you know, I tried to cut out eating, and that didn't work. So I thought, oh, well, I have to do some way to burn it off. Um, <laughs> I try. I used to run, and I used to. I started off walking because I was heavier. And when I got to where I could walk through the neighborhood, we live in the Ingleside area. Then I started running, and then you know, as you start to get older, and I'm, I'm not ashamed to say I'm going to be 60 next week. You have to start thinking about your joints and stuff like that. So I started um, getting on a bike. First of all, inside, it's like a spin bike, and then you know, decided that I would. Um, right outside. I've had two wrecks, which are really horrifying, oh but you have to um, get back on the next day or you won't. Yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, I've ridden just since COVID started, like the end of February, 1st of March, 4,000 miles outside, wow. which to me is, you know, a lot of people go, that's nothing, I do that. But that to me is a big goal that I didn't think I would ever do. I know, like if you told me 10 years ago, I'd ride 100 miles, I'd laugh in your face. <laughs> but it, to me, we were on the open roads in the country, so it was safe. And um, 
just seeing beautiful nature and all, it was very soothing to me in a time when we needed to be soothed. And so to put this in perspective, we're here in the Vineville area of Macon, Georgia, and Mark was telling me that he bikes to Dickey Farms. I mean, just, just think about how far that is from here. Uh, I guess whenever and you hilly. bike- And Hilly. And Hilly, that's right. So whenever you bike out there, do you sample something before coming back? We usually do, do have like a kitty cup or something, yeah. Okay, good deal. Yeah, that's why we ride, actually. We, you know, especially in the hot summer, you're like, I gotta have something. <laughs> so, um, no, and I ride with a fun group of people, and you know, it gives you a chance to, um, be in a group without being right next to them, you know, so yeah, you didn't yeah. have to worry about masks and stuff like that. I mean, it really did. I'm a very social person, as everybody knows, and I love parties and planning parties and doing stuff. So it's been a real, I've really had to fight, you know, depression myself because, you know, you, I was telling you, we normally would be in New York right now celebrating my birthday. So lots of people are having to make those alterations to a Christmas that's already sort of uncertain. So um, we need to latch on to what we can to make us feel better. And, I, and exercise makes me feel better and helps with my issue, with mm -hmm. my leg, my veins. I got you. And speaking of the issue with your leg, I understand that you had not one, but but disease, <laughs> and that you ended up going to Dr. Harper, vein specialist of the South. Can you tell us a little bit about Sure. That? It was, I guess, about eight or 10 years ago. I'm not for sure, but it's been a good while. Um, I had, I, at that time, I was just spinning in class, and, and I just love spinning and my you know sometimes when you would spend too much and this is why it's so dangerous and people need to know that they need to get it checked out because I just thought I had strained my calf mm. muscle and it didn't go away and I thought well you know that's weird and so I was doing it felt like I had done a bunch you know where you're standing on the edge of a step and drop down and then yep, stand yep. up on your shoulder it felt like I'd done like a thousand of those but it was just in one calf and I thought something is, you know, this is, and so I was about to go get, somebody said, you just got to you know, muscle this sore or something, you need to go get a massage. And I was about to schedule that, and I thought, you know, I better, um, you know, I'd heard of Ken Car Harper, and I thought, I better, um, you know, call and just see if there's something going on with the vein. And what, what, how I got it was I had a kidney stone, and um, had, they had to go in and remove, I had to go into the hospital for one day for them to remove it because I couldn't pass it. And just from being in that hospital bed for one day, I got that caught. So wow. when I when he so I went to Ken, he's like he asked me questions, you know, certain questions about if I lift up my your, my toes, did it do this and do that? And he met me down there on on Fourth of July day. They were closed so yeah. that he could see what it was, and then maybe come back in. And he you know because he ultrasounded it and, and in fact found one, and then. I think I, we got that one under control. And then maybe a year later, I had two in one leg and one in the other, which is really rare. Goodness. And that gave him alarm. So they test, he sent me to the, um, actually the same place you go with the cancer stuff to be tested because he thought, I guess that's one of the signs of um, cancers with blood clots and stuff. Wow. So, I mean, I thought, how do I go from being stoned, like kidney stoned, <laughs> to clotted? to going through that tube to see if I've got cancer. I mean, that, that'll scare you to death. Found out that I had a blood disorder that I got at birth from one of my parents called Factor V Leiden, which makes you more susceptible to blood clots and DVTs and pulmonary embolisms. Wow. And, um, you know, I was I mean, I thought, boy, this is weird. So, you know, I had to check with my other family members and my son to make sure. But I, I went from being stoned to clotted to, um, you know, just having a Factor V thing. So. My my thing to the people watching this would be is don't say, try to second guess something because I literally thought I had just overworked my calf. Yeah, yeah. And it could have, you know, you think, oh, that's just in your calf, but it could have run up there, got into my, you know, went through my lungs. And, you know, really that's what a heart attack or um, stroke is, is you're just throwing a clot somewhere. Wow. So um, it's scary stuff. So, I, you know, that's one reason I kind of beefed up my riding and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Because see, thank goodness Dr. Harper was able to, to see that. And, that's you know, right. Able to point you in the right direction. That's there. right. And came in. I'm sure he, <laughs> that was nice of him to come in on a holiday as well. That's that's great. That's great. So let's 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 talk about something a lot more fun than, okay. you know, clots and, and all of that <laughs> stuff and even veins. Stones you know, and everything I, I want to hear about decorating. And so okay. in, in your house, which will likely be like many others, you know, there won't be as many people right. around. Tell us how we can have a great COVID Christmas with a, a few less people here than normal. Okay, well, with my friends, what I've seen happen is, and I'm somewhere in between, people have that have been quarantined 
have had a chance to get out stuff they hadn't had out in years. And so they're like putting everything Christmas they have out. <laughs> and I see the pictures on Facebook and I'm thinking they, they're doing like what I do normally, but I'm like, but with me, it's like, like I told you earlier, it's going back to getting prize possessions out, things that, you know, and doing less of it. Mm-hmm. Or there's some people, and I don't recommend this at all, that are just saying, you know, I'm not having a party. I'm just going to be here by myself with my wife or you know, family. I'm not going to decorate. And I don't recommend that either because... We have to have some kind of glitter and glamour around us at Christmas. I mean, and, and in fact, I almost came this close to not doing anything because I thought yeah. we we're going to be with my sons. And Deborah said, um, you're, you're not going to turn 60 and not have any Christmas. <laughs> and so, you know, what happens is when you start getting one thing out, you know, two other things come out. You're thinking something else out with that, blah, blah, blah. But one thing we did scale down on was our tree. I, um, I'm kind of known, in fact, Christopher Radko um, he's, he designs uh, ornaments for people that don't know. He um, did a call out on my tree. Uh, we had a tree that is so, it's, you know, covered. I think we have like close to four or 500 ornaments. I just didn't feel like doing that this year. I, I knew I needed a new larger tree. So last year before we knew about all this COVID stuff, we ordered one of those Balsam Hill, one of those really pretty trees that look real. Yeah. And so I was really excited about this year because I thought we're going to get it out. I'm going to get all those ornaments that I haven't been able to put on there. And then, you know, do it. But then I thought, you know, why would I do that with just me and Deborah here? You know, because when you do that, the next thing I'm going to be in the party person that I am is I want to have a party and all that. So <laughs> we're going to wait and let that debut itself next Christmas. And hopefully we'll have this all behind us, I'm praying. But um, so what I did was just, you know, somewhere in the middle. But I, more power to the people that are getting it out, all of it, because I think that's wonderful, even if it is just for their family. I just don't want anybody to be in... Um, some kind of state where they're uh, at home by themselves or just with one other person and there's no Christmas, it, to me, that would be very sad. Well, it sounds like that we're going to be taking a tour around the house and looking at some different things, so stay tuned for the tour. This year, since COVID was going on, I decided that instead of moving all of these plates and statues and things like that off of my mantle, that I would just leave them in place and add touches of Christmas. Like, this would be an urn that would be here normally and I just you know put that in there set that there he's always here these are just vintage Christmas trees just give and touch of Christmas but toned down just a little bit the tree since I didn't put up the Christopher Radko tree I had remembered I had a collection of 54 of these antique little vintage clip-on birds I also make um, boxes I call them these little I love it I'm fascinated with like I call them Hollywood boxes um, this is not one like that, but I always wrap my boxes where you can open them up and see what the gift is without disrupting the paper because my grandmother used to make that into a 30 minute deal so she could use the paper again the next year. I set out a few smaller things just on tables like that, a little couple, touch of trees back there. I didn't even get out any of my Christmas pillows. I usually put up all the pillows and just get out Christmas ones that I've had made and designed. I designed these stockings, I did put these out, but they're normally in a different place. This is all silk, but I just drew a pattern, had a friend put it together. This is a coffee table that sits in front of our um, sofa in the living room. These are all little pieces of porcelain and stuff that I've collected over the years. Normally I would clear all this off and it would totally be Christmas. This year I decided to leave that in place and then just add the one focal Christmas item. This is our dining room table that I change out plates because I did a whole collection of 10 Santa porcelain plates. Sometimes I'd set it with that. This year I just felt like doing a botanical kind of look with boxwood that's been preserved. And I went that direction. And the only thing really on here that says Christmas is are these little, I got these in New York, the little Christmas trees that are beaded. So I use those for the little napkin holders. One of my favorite rooms is the sun room. This is a really fun room and warm and cozy. I love sitting out here. Normally, I have a collection of like 75 globes, like snow globes, but I, and so I built a tiered thing to put it on. I didn't put that out this year. Instead, I just showcased some of my favorite things. We usually go to New York at Christmas, so we have over the years collected all these taxi cabs. And so I've told people for years, when you have a collection, whether you have three things or you have a hundred, the best way to showcase that collection is to group it together. You wouldn't see, see them as well as you do when they're all in one place. This table has a really nice, I think it's from Germany, kind of um, Santa Claus. And so instead of having it amongst, you know, 500 I have, 
he's just making a statement himself, which is different, but it's, it goes back to what I said about this COVID's made us rethink a lot of things, and we're looking at things that mean the most to us and the things that make us happy, and that's what I'm surrounding myself with. All right, so we just wrapped up the tour. Mark has truly a beautiful home. Mark, I especially love the paintings. Those are just, in particular, what really spoke to me. I've just always admired those about you. Um, I am curious, though, what events do you have coming up that people can find you at and learn more about you? Well, with COVID, I'm not so sure, because a lot of my events got canceled this year, but a good way to follow me is on Facebook, become a follower. I think I'm at the friend limit. Uh, it's listed under Mark Ballard. Um, or Instagram at Mark Creates. Um, same thing at Facebook is that at Mark Creates. Um, that's where I post everything about my new merchandise. My new. Well, I was teaching art class, and we've had to cancel doing that. But uh, hopefully, before long, we're going to get um, all this back up and rolling. And it's interesting you mentioned that because I started taking art lessons, the paintings, as private lessons when I was eight years old. Wow. Every Tuesday after school. And then as a result, got a scholarship to the Atlanta College of Art, which is now SCAD. Yeah. Back, yeah. In, the, back in the day, as my son said, the dark ages. So um, I was a trained, you know, fine artist. And then I never even wanted to be on TV or doing this other stuff. I certainly never thought I'd ever do a cookbook or anything. And, you know, they, I decorated Dale Ward's set or something one time. And they said, why don't you do a segment? And it started off as two minutes. And then I ended up doing one-hour specials and all that. So every so my artwork got put on hold because I was making wreaths and you know yeah. cooking and selling cookbooks and blah blah blah, and I, every time in the back of my head my art teacher was Hauser Smith he's been gone a long time but he was a renowned person in making back in the day, and I could just hear him thinking wow are you on TV. <laughs> <laughs> making that crappy wreath when you should be painting. And so, you know, after I kind of phased out TV, I did a lot, of, started doing more painting and started teaching art class because he, he, he had made such a difference in my life. And I got better and better because, you know, the more you paint and draw, the better you get. So well, I tried to, I got to thinking one day, what if I'd never stopped and had not had that other career, what, what I would be doing, but... Um, it's interesting you mentioned that because that's what a lot of people don't know me as an artist. How many paintings have you have you done? Oh, uh, I can't even even try. I, I and I've got portfolios of stuff in my studio that when I go out and talk to people and I try to keep one of every card. And my wife reminded me the other day that when I was just out right out of college, I said if I could just get something printed, a printed piece. If I could just have, and you know I've done so many printed pieces and stuff now that she said I think you got a printed piece but you know you never look at it like that when you're going through it I was just like all these people have stuff that they mail out and printed stuff and you know now I have a actually a note card line so you know it it's amazing how things I think things happen for a reason and I, I never have any regrets about it I mean it was just when that tv thing happened it happened just basically overnight I mean I was on there two minutes the next day, week they gave me four minutes the next week I had two segments and before you knew it, it had been, you know, 18 years and wow. I had five cookbooks and all that. And so um, it's funny how your life takes turns that, you know, you don't know why. But I think yeah. everything happens for a reason. I'm a definite believer in that mm -hmm. for sure. All right. So before we go, I know you have multiple cookbooks out, but Christmas dinner is just around the corner. He is so I'm, interested in my Christmas dinner. I'm telling you, yeah, <laughs> I can I can envision someone sitting at home and saying, I need to get one of these cookbooks. Can you give us just one that you would suggest someone get with Christmas dinner in mind? Um, two of them. Okay. Uh, there are tip for tap. These two. Uh, one is called the Four Seasons. And it, I divided it into four seasons and did food appropriately. You would like it because there's like a Thanksgiving section. Um, and then the other one is my latest one, which is called Deli Just Simply Delicious. I decided I would reach out to some celebrities from Macon and people like that. And like I got something from Barbara and Vince Dooley, something from uh, Nancy Grace, um, something from Kevin Brown. Nancy, one of the things Nancy put in there, and I know everybody's heard of this a thousand times, is taco soup. You know, like... Mm -hmm. um, and if there's a million different directions, uh, recipes for it, but hers is just the best. Really? I mean, it's worth buying delicious to get the recipe. Um, I, and when it makes it, it makes, when you want to move, if you want to feed a whole troop of people, it makes like two soup pot, pot bowls of stuff. <laughs> but it has, the thing I think that makes it so good is it has two things of that dry 
Hidden Valley Ranch dressing mm -hmm. and two taco like fajita stuff and then two things of salsa and every bean there is and it just is you know semi good for you but um so I think it's got like three or four pounds of ground beef you know it's just amazing but you can eat on it all the time we freeze it and so yeah, it's relatively inexpensive to thing to make so if I could only if you only could only get one cookbook this year I would get delicious delicious okay yeah. good deal well Mark Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for this joining us. It's been a blast. We have really enjoyed <laughs> this. And stay tuned for the next episode with myself and Dr. Harper. You never know where, where we might show up.